Welcome to First Baptist Church of Walnut Creek. We are studying the book of Revelation. I'd like you to open up your Bibles to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 11. Katie's going to come up and read for us. Katie? Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for forty-two months. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy one thousand two hundred and sixty days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. And they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt where also our Lord was crucified. Then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Now, after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here! And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. In the same hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed, and the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple, and there were lightning, noises, thunderings, an earthquake, and great hail. Revelation chapter 11, we'll be spending most of our time in today. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for passages like this that sound very ominous, causes some many questions and maybe even fear to rise up into our minds. And yet, you write and record this so that we might understand and we might know what your plans are. And we thank you for that. Give us insight and understanding today. In Jesus' name, amen. 
two powerful witnesses arise in Israel during the Great Tribulation. The miracles these two men perform are likened to the Old Testament prophets of old. People will be offended by the words of these men, outraged by their unwillingness to accept society's new truths. Global warming is a fact. Evolution is undeniable. Elvis Presley is alive. The population of the world receives the message of these two witnesses as hateful words from an outdated, unwelcome, and condemned book, supposedly written by a fictional, mythical, and imagined God. Yet to the Christian church, the two witnesses offer endless hours of speculation. The following, those who follow the spiritual interpretation of Scripture, have identified these two witnesses as the Old Testament and the New Testament. Not likely. Others identify these witnesses as Elijah and Enoch because they never died. And they use Hebrews 9, 27. You know the passage. It is appointed unto men once to die, hereafter the judgment. But I have a question for you, if that's true. How many of you are expecting to die? Or maybe I should say, how many of you are expecting not to die? Raise your hand. Okay, so me. I'm the only one here in church that's expecting not to die. I'm expecting the rapture to take place and to take me into heaven. I'm expecting not to die. Now, how many of you are expecting not to die? A few more. Good for you. Excellent. You see, <laughs> I am looking, according to God's word, that Christ is going to return with a, with, a, with a trumpet and a shout of the archangel, and boom, I'm out of here. I'm not going to die. Now, it's possible... 30 years from now, I will be dead, most likely, because I'm getting older. But some of you who are younger, like Jonathan, he'll still be alive. <laughs> the point is, if I use Hebrews 9.27 as the idea that, wait a minute, everybody has to die, and then judgment takes place, that's kind of faulty thinking. But perhaps, maybe these two people could be Elijah and Moses. Because after all, we look at the miracles that these people are doing. Fire coming down from heaven. Blood. Water being turned to blood. I mean, these are the miracles in which Moses and Elijah did in the Old Testament. Surely it must be these two guys that have been resurrected and now they are back on earth. But think about this for a moment. How many times has God resurrected somebody from the past to be a witness in the present? No, no, no. Think for a moment. How many times has God used individuals in the past to be a present witness? Imagine when Jesus was walking the earth. If he would have resurrected Moses and Aaron, what a powerful witness they would have been. Instead, he gathers 12 uneducated men mostly fishermen, who are known for telling tall tales, i.e. lying, to be his witness. And were they really good at what their job was? Took them three and a half years to get on track, besides the inner fighting and other things that were taking place. But imagine Moses and Aaron, if they were resurrected, surely the nation of Israel would have followed them. Now, we see an ongoing thing from the very beginning. God always uses current people to be his witnesses so who are these two witnesses i have no idea most likely they are two men who believe during the time of the great tribulation and god uses them to stand for him and be a witness for him and that's what's important it's not who they are it's what they witness that's the key thing that takes place during this time well with finishing chapter 11, which we'll do today, we are at the halfway point of the book of Revelation. Being at this the halfway point, this would be a good time for us to take a test. I know the word, just saying the word test, causes a little bit of anxiety, a little bit of tension in the room. So let me ask you some questions. These are all things that you know the answer. I know that you know the answers to these tests. So to begin with, what does the word revelation mean what does the word revelation mean? 
The revealing of Jesus Christ. And the next question is, who does it reveal? And you answered that already. It reveals Jesus Christ. What is the key verse to the book of Revelation? What is the key verse? It's found in what chapter? Chapter 1, and it's verse... 19. Excellent. So do a cheat in your Bible. You've got verse 19 there. Walk through the outline of the book. Chapter 1 is about the past. Chapters 2 and 3 are about the present. Chapters 4 through 22 are about the future. See, I knew this. And see, you're going to pass the test when you get to heaven. Not that there's a test in heaven when you get there, but it just helps you to think through things. So, let's get into more details. Where does John take us in chapters 4 and 5? Where does John take us in chapters 4 and 5? To heaven. The heavenly scene. We get to see the throne and everything else. In chapter 6, what is Christ doing in chapter 6? He has a scroll in hand, and what does he do with the scroll? He's popping the seals. All right. You're doing great. This is fantastic. You are thinking your way through this book. That is fantastic. So if someone says, do you know what the book of Revelation is? Apparently you do. Chapter 7. This is the answer to what question? Chapter 7 is the answer to what question? Who is able to stand? Because the seal judgments are so bad... Who is able to stand during this? Then chapters uh, 9 or 8 and 9. What happens in chapters 8 and 9? What judgments? The trumpets judgments. So we hear the sounding of the trumpet judgments. All right, here's the bonus. Because this was last week. Maybe not everybody here was here last week. What did we talk about last week? I know it's... Seven days ago. It was a long time. What is... <laughs> you have your Bibles. You have a cheat. So you have the cliff notes, if you will. You have the Word of God for you. What is the main... Remember, we're in the second interlude. There's chapter 10 is about one big thing. And then chapters 11 is about another big thing. When I say big, that's the hint. An angel, and what does he have in his hand? A little scroll. So chapter 10, we are introduced to this big giant angel with a little book in his hand. And then chapters 11, we're going to get to today, but it's really about the two witnesses. Right? So you're 11 chapters in, and you've got the book down so far. So for people who say, wait a minute, the book of Revelation is too confusing. No, it's not. And apparently, by your faithful attending... By coming each week, you are seeing, look, one day a week for 30, 40 minutes, you are getting this. You are seeing that you can understand it. You can follow along and see what's taking place. And that's the big flow of what's, taking, what's happening here. All right. So, today, remember we mentioned already chapters 10 and 11. This is the second pause or the interlude. The interlude is God's plan to explain special information about people, places, or events during the Great Tribulation. It does not continue or precede the chronological information about the judgments. It basically says, wait, let's stop and talk about some things that are taking place during that seven-year period. Information you need to know about, mostly about Jesus Christ and what he's doing, his judgments... Right? And the things that are transpiring on earth. So we dealt with chapter 10 last week, chapter 11. We see the temple, we see the two witnesses, and the seventh trumpet. Therefore, our outline is really easy to follow. First, we will examine the temple of God. Second, we will observe the two witnesses of God. And lastly, we will see the seventh trumpet of God. So that's pretty easy to follow. So let's get right into it. We will, we will begin with examining the temple of God. Sometime between now and the middle of the seven-year tribulation, Israel will build a temple again in Jerusalem and restore the Levitical worship system. How and when? I have no idea. But again, many people will tell us all about how that's going to take place. 
the question that currently stumps us, how is this going to be done when there is a Muslim temple on the worship mount? And I know that there are some Christians who are saying, wait a minute, you could have the Muslim, the Dome of the Rock, on the temple mount along with the tabernacle. Because it could fit side by side. Wait a second. Think through this in your mind for a minute. Where in the Old Testament does God ever say, isn't it a great idea to have worship of God here and worship of false idols here? Let's do that. That'd be a great idea. That never existed in the Old Testament. So can you imagine that God's going to say somewhere in the future we are going to have worship of the Lord God, another temple being built, and... We'll have other worship, other opportunities for you to worship, things maybe you would like to worship in secondary nature. It doesn't happen. So somehow the Dome of the Rock, this temple, is going to be moved, destroyed, vanished. I have no idea how. But the speculation that both can exist on the mount totally is contrary to the character of God. I will write a book someday explaining how I think it's going to take place. Therefore, I can make a little bit of money, like all the other people are doing. Or I could do it on the website, and there's plenty of places where you can spend hours and part of years of your life uh, looking through and reading all this stuff. But that's just partly of the crazy stuff. The key thing to remember is sometime the nation of Israel is going to rebuild this. But Israel has not had a temple since 70 A.D. when Rome destroyed it. And yet here in Revelation 11, the temple is seen as being reconstructed. And John is given the task of measuring it in verse 11. Then I'm given a reed. This is John who is given this reed. And it's like a measuring rod. We say, okay, what kind of measuring rod is this? Is this like our ruler? No. Is this like a yardstick? No. In fact, their measuring reeds were anywhere from 10 and a half to about 12 feet in length. But notice what he's measuring. He's talking about measuring these things where God says, this is what I want you to measure. Measure, rise and measure the temple of God, the altar of God, and those who worship therein. So go through and measure those things that deal with buildings, would deal with things of worship, and deal with people. Now, this is not speculating that in this time that there's going to be people who are 10 and a half to 12 feet tall. But God has a standard. He has a measurement in which he expects things to be focused upon. So John is given this measurement, and he's not the only one who's had to go through and measure things. In the Old Testament, Ezekiel has a vision, and he sees a man with the measuring rod in the temple. Zechariah, same thing. He sees a vision, and here's a man measuring the temple. In Revelation 21, verse 15 through 17, lo and behold, we have, a, again, an individual who is measuring the new Jerusalem. Why is it important for this measurement? Well, the measurements always tell us and show us that God is evaluating what belongs to him. God evaluates, his, evaluates the places of worship. Is it used for his purpose and his purpose only? Notice that the Old Testament, the temple was not a multi-purpose building. Think about that for a moment. The tabernacle was not a multi-purpose building. It was set aside only for him. But somewhere in our life, we look at the church and we think it's a multi-purpose building. Now, excuse me for a moment. I am not referring to this structure. I'm talking about the bride of Christ. I'm talking about you and I. We are the church. And somehow we think we are a multifunctioning unit as opposed to we are set aside for God. That's what we are set aside for. We are not to be part God on Sunday and then part of the world and the bar scene and the disco scene. I don't know if there's any discos left, but you get the idea. Uh, Friday and Saturday. Are we to God or are we to take a side, make a choice? This is part of what the book of Revelation is about. Choose this day who you are going to serve. 
Here's the standard that's laid out. He goes to the altar. He's evaluating the tools of worship. Is it used for his worship? Is it dedicated to him alone? It's not that the tools of worship have a secondary function. Those tools of worship belong to God and should be used for God. So when we have things that we are dedicating in our life to God, use it for God. If you need to go buy another one, then go buy another one. Some of our things that we need to challenge ourselves on, especially with our multimedia stuff, is we need to dedicate it to God. And perhaps we never have. And that's why we struggle and we stumble, because it connects us to immorality so easily. And we need to say, Lord, this phone is to be used for you and you alone, and I dedicate this to you, or this laptop, or this big screen TV that I am worshiping the football team, or whatever on it. I'm giving it to you. I'll watch my secular stuff on you. Okay, I get that. But take your things and say, if it's for God, and I'm for God, then be holy with it. Set it apart for Him. All right. He also evaluates his people of worship. Do they follow his pattern? The idea that God will accept any type of worship so long as it is genuine or sincere is just false. Follow the example of Cain and Abel. That should be a strong reminder to us. God is not looking for sincerity of heart or genuineness of what we do. So long as we mean it really with all of our heart, God will take it. That's not true. Throughout the Old Testament, God says, here's how you will worship me. If you want to come before me, this is what you must do. You must follow my way and only my way. Again and again, we see over and over again where people say, wait a minute. God says to worship in Jerusalem in the Old Testament. And yet people said, wouldn't it be convenient if we had smaller locations that were easier and more convenient for us? And people, yeah, that would be great. Can't we worship in Samaria? Yeah, that'd be great. God, no, you can't. If you want to come, you make the effort and you come to me. We have the same thing today in our little worship wars. It's the challenge. I will go to church when it's convenient. Eight o'clock would be convenient because then I'd have the whole day. Or two o'clock would be convenient because then I could sleep in. So can the pastor and the churches make a decision that would be more convenient for me? When do we get serious and say, wait a minute, God. Are we going to worship him according to his, what's important to him? Now, there's nowhere in the Bible that says church has to start at a certain time. I get that. But we do, and we should set a time together and say, this is going to be our time that we're going to worship him, and then do so. All of this needs to really meet his standard, his character. These two verses are contrasted with one another because God is measuring and saying, here's my standard. And then we see how man's standard is in verse 2. He says, but leave out the outer court, which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it's been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread on the holy city underfoot for 42 months, for three and a half years. Now remember, the Jewish people were not respecting the temple when Jesus came. When Jesus came to the temple mount, what was taking place? They were... It was like a giant yard sale. They were exchanging money. The cattle and the sheep were up there. You could come and buy your sacrifice at a discount right here, right now. And we'll give you a special rate right here. And of course, the courtyard, if you've ever been on the Temple Mount, this is a great way to make a shortcut across instead of going all the way around it. That was inconvenient to go all the way around it. Just cut over the Temple Mount. Make it fast and easy. And Jesus gets there and goes, wait a minute, this is supposed, my house is supposed to be a house of prayer. You're defaming it. This is wrong. So he makes a whip. And can you imagine all these money changers? The table goes over and money goes scattering everywhere. What do you think people's response is when money goes flying? Get the money. And all of a sudden while he's doing this and all the cattle are, are, are scattered 
And they start mooing, and they start, and the sheep start bleeding, and, and, and they start spreading out everywhere. And he's got this whip. It's complete chaos. And everyone is running after their goods. And someone says, hey, what right do you have to do this? You can't do this. Wait a minute. I have every right to do this because this belongs to me. You have no right to treat this as common. This is holy. But this is how man treats the things of God. And so during the seven-year tribulation, this is the key thing. Even while this is taking place, God has a standard, and he holds to that standard. And we see mankind will just tread on the things of God and treat them like garbage. Because it doesn't really matter to man. So we see this taking place in the temple of God. The second thing that we see taking place in verse 3, we have these two witnesses of God. Now, what's really interesting about these two witnesses, at least it seems to me, is we see their ministry. The ministry of these two men, we're told, he says, I will give power to my two witnesses and they will prophesy 1,260 days. In other words, three and a half years. 42 months, right? So they have a time period to how long their ministry is going to be. And then they get the retirement plan, which is death, or you may call it rapture, or you may call it, you know, whatever it is, it's the God retirement plan. They work for three and a half years and it's over. It's done. The point is they know there's a beginning and there's an end. It's not a 60 year plan. It's just a three and a half years. They're aware of it. God's aware of it. They're dressed in sackcloth, which is a sign of mourning. They dress like John the Baptist dressed or like Elijah dressed. It's not like they dress in fine clothes and saying, well, make sure you wear a suit. Their dress would cause people to say, what's wrong with you? That is not the latest fashion. It's not the latest fashion today. It's definitely not going to be the latest fashion in the future. But their dress causes people to look at them and say, there's something definitely wrong with these people. And yet we see in the description of their ministry, they are called two olive trees and two lampstands. Just like Joshua the high priest and Zerubbabel, the civic leader, who were raised up by God to be lights in dark times. And they were empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now, again, in verse 3, God says, they are my witnesses. You need to circle that. They are not witnesses for somebody else. They are God's witnesses. They belong to him. And you might think that after all the miracles that these guys do, because when we see the power of their miracles, that they are able to, at will, turn water into blood, smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will, cause the rain to stop coming, call fire down from heaven at anybody who threatens their life. You can imagine someone's going to be bold enough at this time and say, we need to get rid of those guys. Just run up there and shoot them. Okay, I'll do it. They run up there to go to shoot these guys and fire comes out and kills them and consumes the person. You think with all the miracles that these two are doing, the whole world would obviously become believers in Jesus Christ immediately. Because what sign and wonder could these guys not do during this short three and a half year period? Because there are many people who think, if we just had more signs and wonders, surely more people would come to know. No. It's not really how it works at all. More signs and wonders do not cause people to believe. In fact, it just causes more people to despise what God is doing. Remember Ahaz, or uh, 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 Ahaz, but uh, Ahaz... Uh, Ahiza, he falls down. This is back in uh, 2 Kings chapter 1. And he calls out to find out one of the false gods. Find out if I'm going to be okay. I've hurt myself and I need to find out whether I'm going to live or not. Elijah finds out about this and says, hey, isn't there a God in Israel? The servant comes back and you go tell your master this. So the servant goes back and says, I met Elijah along the way, and and he tells the king this. And the king is upset. How dare Elijah do this? So he sends 50 guards after him. And 50 guards come up to Elijah and says, all right, we're here to arrest you in the name of the king. And Elijah says, if I'm not a prophet of God, then fire won't come down out of heaven and and destroy all of you. Well, fire comes down and wipes all of them out. 
So another 50 or cent, same thing. The third group that comes, the captain is smart, and get, bows down and says, please spare our lives. So even the power of the government can't stand against the man of God. If you're following God, these two men, even the governments can't arrest them and pull them away. They can try all they want, but it won't do any good. Because they are there to serve God. But even though their ministries are short and they do super miraculous things, their witnessing is to point everybody and say, there is a Christ. He does exist. And they are doing this in the middle of Jerusalem. The same place where Christ was executed. The same place in which it tells us that during this during this place, Jerusalem is like Sodom, meaning that it's a place of immorality. It's like the land of Egypt. Slavery abounds. And yet, after a certain amount of time, in verses 5 through 7, we see that eventually these guys are killed. It says, if anybody wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth, and if anybody and he must be killed like manner. These have power to shut the heavens and no rain for the days of their prophecy. And they have power over the waters to turn blood, to turn to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues. In verse 7 it says, And when they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war over them and overcome them and kill them. So the beast, the Antichrist, arrives on the scene. And the people cheer. Because here's finally one person after three and a half years stands up to these holy rollers and calls them out. And he seems to be able to overcome them and beat them and destroy them. And the whole world is, a, is cheering. Finally, these, this leader of men is able to stand forward and say, you two prophets of God, he has the strength and he destroys them. Now that might seem surprising to us. How can two of God's men fall? It's all part of God's plan. Well, their bodies are left out in public for the world media to cover and to celebrate. Imagine this taking place. The way our news media covers, if you're a CNN follower or if you are Fox News, I'm just going to pick on them because they are the two big ones that most everybody here reads or, or follows. And they, news break, news flash, the two prophets have been, have been killed. And there is celebration taking place all around the world. Everybody is happy. It doesn't matter which news agents you follow, you'd be thrilled to death and the whole world would be celebrating. So much so, they'd be giving each other gifts. And the news cameras would be on these two bodies and they would leave them in the streets so everybody could witness this and see this. And the bodies look crumpled and humiliated on the streets of Jerusalem. And there'd be a long celebration. Maybe the celebration is supposed to take place for a whole week. I have no idea. But the people are celebrating. The cameras of this are on all the time as they are reporting. Did you see what happened? I sure did. We saw the beast and he came. They're not going to call him the beast. We'll call him the, the leader, whatever they're going to call him. And he finally overcame them. It was awesome. It was like, pow, took them out. It was great. They're done. Finally, we've gotten rid of perhaps the last leaders, the last of those believers who believe in God and the followers of Christ. Let us celebrate because finally it's over. We've got rid of all those Bible people. Yes. And who overcame them? The one true God, the new God, the beast. He is God because only he was strong enough. Just like in the old days. In the old days, if an army came in and defeated your country, that means his gods were more powerful than your gods. So, the beast comes and defeats the two witnesses. He must be stronger than their gods. And that's how the world sees it. Except, while the cameras are on, while everybody's watching, 
all of a sudden, verse 11, something takes place. We see their metamorphosis. After three and a half days, the breath of life of God entered them, and they stood on their feet. Picture this, all of a sudden, you have a a camera that's on them, and all of a sudden, a hand moves. A foot wiggles. (gasps) Breaking news. Something's going on. We don't know what it is. The two witnesses we saw dead, they get up, and they move. This is before the whole wide world is seeing this take place. The corpse are being filmed by the news agencies that we respect and depend upon. (laughs) God resurrects these these bodies, and people hear the voice of God call out to the two witnesses, come up here. And the bodies begin to rise off the ground, and they ascend into heaven in the cloud. The defeat of of God was sorely mistaken. An earthquake shakes the city of Jerusalem and 7,000 people are killed and a tenth of the city is leveled. And the people that are in the town and the city, they respond in fear and acknowledge God. Does this mean that the people have a heart to heart and they believe in God? I don't think so. The information here in the end tells us that the second woe has passed. Remember, each of the woes is connected to the trumpet judgment. One woe, remember after the four trumpets said, whoa, look out, three more trumpet sounds. As bad as the four trumpets were, look out, there's three more trumpet blasts. And the first woe was after the fifth. And the second woe is after the sixth. And basically they're saying after the sixth trumpet, this is the end of the sixth. Get, giving you a time frame or a time stamp saying, all right, Look out, the second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming. And the third woe is the last trumpet. And we know the last trumpet is the seventh trumpet of God. In the seventh trumpet of God, we have the trumpet sound. There's just really two big things that come out of here. We have the trumpet sound and we have the temple scene. There's just the, these are the two big things. But what we have is everything that's taking place in heaven. We don't have any scene that's taking place on earth, but we do see what's going on in heaven. And in here we have the proclamation of the angels. When the seventh angel sounded, there was a loud voice in heaven saying, that loud voice is like a shout. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. The, cel- the celebration begin. As far as heaven is concerned, the deed is done. It is over. The victory belongs to our Lord, and let him reign forever and ever. The sounding of the seventh trumpet is the beginning of the end. The bull judgments are about to be poured out. We won't see that until we get to chapter 16. But when they're poured, it's going to happen fast, and the destruction is going to be complete. Well, but what's going on in heaven? So the angels are making this announcement. Hooray! Christ is going to reign forever and ever. And then remember, there's 24 elders that are sitting around the throne. And their response... In verse 16, they fall off their thrones. Well, they don't fall. They get down on their hands and knees and their faces and they worship God. And they say, we give thanks, O Lord, God Almighty, the one who is and the one who was and the one who is to come. We see the adoration of the elders. As the elders are speaking out, they give thanks. What is the object of their thanks? His power, his being, and his act. His being, you you. You are the God who is, who was, and who is to come. You are the everlasting God. Because you have taken your great power and you reigned. That's the act of God. We see in verse 18, it says, The nations were angry. Why were the nations angry? Why why do the nations get angry at God? Why do they hate the things of God? Why do they hate the people of God? Why do they hate the things of God? Why is it the actions of man say, we hate the image of God, so let us destroy it in the womb. We hate the law and character of God, so let us take, we'll say, the Ten Commandments, and let us pervert them. Taking the Lord's vein is nothing. What does that mean? Stealing? Stealing is not really stealing. It's borrowing. 
Murder? Well, you can't really help somebody who murdered somebody. They were, it's society's fault. Or you don't understand how they were born and they were raised. They're from a divorced family. That's the excuse. They had a Twinkie. They're insane. They're out of balance. They're homeless. Pick an excuse. People covet one another's things. What can you expect? They had a bad up, up, upbringing. Life's not fair. We need equality and we need equity to solve everything. Why are the nations angry? Because his wrath has come. And the time of the dead, and that they should be judged, and that you should reward the servants and the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Man is in a perpetual state of wanting to destroy and ruin things. What's the temple scene? The temple scene is just this. We look in and the temple says opened and there was the Ark of the Covenant. Inside the covenant, there were three things that were in the Ark of the Covenant. The main thing that's in there is the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are these ten laws and the ten laws are really just symbols of His character. And even though we can eliminate and get rid of the Ten Commandments out of school, out of our federal buildings, out of all of our buildings, the problem is you cannot remove the character of God. You cannot say, I know that we can eliminate and pull off and remove the words that were written on rock, but you cannot remove the words that are written on a heart. So folks, a storm is coming. There was lightning and noises and thunder and earthquake and great hail. And each time that we saw the end of the seven seals, seven trumpets, and the seven bulls, we'll see a storm. God is coming. And when He comes, it's terrible. The presence of God changes those who are before Him and changes everything around Him. So what do we learn about from this interlude? Because my time is about up. Really quick, we learn that the character of God will be the standard just as it's the standard for today. It's not the standard by the law that makes, because our law is not looking for what is true. It's got to be the standard. God says, here's what is true. Jesus says, I am truth. Not what somebody in some, na- some capital somewhere says, oh, we're going to redefine what truth is. No. It's important for us to pick a side. There is a penalty for law. And the penalty of the law is death. And God makes that clear. There's a consequence for us breaking His law, not meeting His standard. But God also provided a provision. And God's provision is life. It's the life that He's given to us through Jesus Christ. And he's made it so that anybody, anybody, doesn't matter what your background is, doesn't matter where you were born, doesn't matter what you've done, the life provision is all you have to do is reach out and take it. But you have to be the one to take it. You say, well, how do I take it? All you have to do is say, I believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose again from the dead. But don't I have to do? No. It's there. You take it. I believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose again from the dead. That's right. Because God has done all the work. And God continues to do all the work. But you've got to pick a side. Let's close in a word of prayer. Let me follow, Lord, we thank you for the interlude and the information that you provide for us in the book of Revelation. Just reminding us again who's in control and who's going to win. The battle really does belong to you, and the victory belongs to you also. Sometimes we just get so excited and so bent out of shape over things that we have no control over, 
And in the process, we forget that you have absolutely control of what's taking place. And things are working according to your plan, and we just praise you for that. And we thank you for our time together. In Jesus' name, amen.